The Minneapolis Police Department is under a microscope right now. The United States Department of Justice is in the midst of an extensive investigation into MPD trying to determine if there is a pattern of excessive force and discriminatory policing. To better understand it, we are bringing you the story of another city that's been under that same scrutiny for years. Investigative reporter Kirsten Swanson traveled to Albuquerque, New Mexico to learn about this process and find out what impact it's had on policing. Tonight, she explains how it all started. Well, Kevin, between 2010 and 2014, Albuquerque police shot and killed more people per capita than any other city in the country. Families who lost loved ones at the hands of police banded together. They tried desperately to get city leaders to understand what was happening. And when those pleas were ignored, they had no choice but to turn to the federal government. We want to warn you, some of the video and the descriptions in this story are difficult to watch. This was like the wild, wild west. There were police involved shootings multiple times a week. As investigators look into the city's 13th officer involved shooting this year, we were in conflict in a lot of ways with uh, the community. Christopher Torres is the man shot and killed by police this afternoon. And DOJ, I think, was our last resort. Angels surround Stefan and Renetta Torres' northwest Albuquerque home, a place they now consider holy ground, was at one time a place Renetta couldn't imagine returning to. I just didn't think I wanted to be where Christopher had died. In 2011, two Albuquerque police detectives dressed in plain clothes came to the home looking for the family's youngest son, Christopher, who had an outstanding warrant in connection to a road rage incident. They jumped this fence into the backyard and tackled the 27-year-old who struggled with schizophrenia. Had him pinned on, on the ground, uh, face down, both of the officers on top of him. And Christopher, of course, was struggling, trying to, and very confused, hollering out, you know, what's going on? This is my house. I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. The officer said Christopher resisted arrest and grabbed one of their guns. So Officer C.J. Brown grabbed his gun. Apparently he felt it was necessary to shoot Christopher three times in the back at point blank range and, and they killed him. And all of that occurred in less than five minutes. Now, right now we're working to bring you all the details we can. There was no video of the shooting and an internal review concluded the officer's actions were justified. It was only after the Torres family sued that they realized this was not an isolated incident. Later on, of course, we find out that it was just the tip of the iceberg. The latest shooting marks 14 involving Albuquerque police this year. We had the highest uh, number of shootings per capita in the country at that time. Laura Shower Ives is a civil rights attorney in Albuquerque who has represented families in some of the most high profile misconduct cases in the department's history. Those same families appealed to city leaders. You no, know, we're all part of a family that no one wants to be a part of, and that family seems to be growing. Why is this officer still allowed to even remain on our force? Amen. They say they were met with silence. I think people got up there to bear their souls in the hope that there would be some, some response to change. And, and there wasn't. We were sort of at our wits end trying to figure out what we could do to try to influence the situation. Peter Simonson is executive director of New Mexico's chapter of the ACLU. He says after meetings with the then mayor, the state attorney general and state lawmakers, the Justice Department was their last resort basically begged for them to come out and intervene somehow. In 2012, the DOJ launched a pattern and practice investigation into the Albuquerque Police Department, but the officer-involved shootings continued. One year we had 10, the next year we had 12. Sean Willoughby is president of the Albuquerque Police Officers Association. We know being in law enforcement that these trends happen. We don't really know why they happen. But Police Chief Harold Medina, who was a commander at the time, said he raised concerns about how officers were trained. I still remember our first day at the academy where uh, one of the first topics we discussed was uh, how good uh, our firearms program was at the police department. And I think that eventually set the stage uh, for where we ended up in 2014. KOB Eyewitness News 4 at 6. 
Did APD officers go too far? In March 2014, Get on the now! Albuquerque police shot and killed James Boyd, a homeless man who struggled with mental illness who'd been camping illegally in the city's foothills. Critics say it's this case that shattered any trust between the public and the police. That was the first shooting that the Albuquerque Police Department had ever captured on tape. I cannot breathe. And just like George Floyd in Minneapolis, Get on the ground. people watched graphic video of a man die before their eyes. <laughs> two hours after police first arrived on scene, officers shot Boyd when he pulled two small knives from his pockets. The chief of police came out and did a press conference and presented this video and said, see, this was a totally justified shooting. Do I believe it was a justified shooting? Yes, there was a directed threat to an officer. You gotta be kidding, you gotta be kidding. As Boyd lay face down on the ground, officers continued to surround him and begin firing less lethal rounds at his body. Drop the knife! Drop the knife! How is it that you can so recklessly treat another human being. Um, you know, George Floyd, unable to breathe. This young man up in, in the foothills, he wasn't hurting anyone. And the entire community was like, well, no, it didn't look justified at all. It did not look like he needed to kill this man. I can't believe he killed this man. The city erupted. And you don't do any good! People were just devastated and angry and horrified. We kind of went through um, a version of what Minneapolis did. It was chaos. I, that's not a word I throw around lightly. They shot canisters on UNM students, helpless people. This was a shooting that really made people start looking closer at that history of the Albuquerque Police Department. A month later, the Justice Department announced its findings. We have determined that there is reasonable cause to believe that the Albuquerque Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of use of excessive force, including the use of unreasonable deadly force. All of this hollering that we had been doing in the wilderness had merit, and, and that there was a significant problem here that needed to be addressed. After the findings, it took the city another year to agree to a set of court-ordered reforms, a settlement that laid out hundreds of changes for the department and intense oversight. Seven years later, that federal oversight continues. There is no walking away from this. We must comply with this court order whether we like it or not. The union argues the reforms come at a cost to public safety. There is no policing going on in the city of Albuquerque. But the Torres family says doing nothing comes at a cost far greater. Yes, our loved ones were killed, but they will not die in vain. We are going to do something to try to make a difference, to make a change, and hopefully see some real reform. So is it working? Has it changed officers in the Albuquerque Police Department? Next week, we talk with current and former law enforcement officials in the city and ask about the success, the challenges, and to see if this process results in real reform, Kevin. Important stories, Kirsten. We're looking forward to next week. Thank you.